Thank you, everyone. I'm very, very pleased to be here. And thanks to Wayne for that wonderful invitation to the museum, for inviting me to the sponsors for the reception. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share uh, this research that I did about Lady Bird Johnson with you. And as Wayne just said, uh, in 1964, during the presidential campaign, uh, Lady Bird embarked on this four, you know, four day, 1,628 mile campaign trip aboard a 19 car train uh, called the Lady Bird Special. And I am gonna invite you to join me on board. Um, she gave 47 speeches in 47 towns and spoke to approximately 500,000 people. Now, in this presentation, what I'm going to present for you is my main argument, and then expand on that, that it was Lady Bird's evocation of the Southern woman and a performance of that that provided her with the rhetorical and persuasive resources to engage in a conversation about reconciliation with Southern white voters. Along the way, the political persona that she embodied and the new Southern womanhood that she enacted subtly also broadened the boundaries of the First Lady role. So, come back with me to 1964 as we ride along on the Lady Bird special. So this evening I'll describe how Lady Bird Johnson used the appeal of her Southern roots to influence public sentiments and to attempt to bind the wounds of, with white Southern Democrats that were inflicted by her husband's sponsorship of civil rights legislation in 1964. To guide you on our travels, I will draw on archival documents, primarily using materials that are available in the collections at the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library, including the White House social files from Lady Bird's press secretary, Liz Carpenter, and her social secretary, Bess Abel, drafts of her speech text, the transcripts of Mrs. Johnson's remarks, and several strategic communications regarding the whistle-stop tour, such as menus, wardrobe choice, entertainment, and train design. So as we all prepare to board that train, let me overview our route. So this analysis is framed within the methods and the approach of a rhetorical analysis. Uh, which is what I do, um, and from this vantage point, I will invite you to consider how Lady Bird used rhetorical strategies, that is, means of influence that were symbolic and performative, as well as were expressed in the messages delivered in her speeches. And she used all of these things to engage her audiences in her vision. On the Whistle Stop tour, she crafted a rhetoric of reconciliation, communication that sought to bridge differences, by reconstructing a shared identity from disparate pieces. In essence, she reconstituted the commons and she reconfigured the common good. And of course, because Lyndon Johnson's 1964 presidential campaign faced a Democratic Party in the South that was a minefield of anger and division, this region was not one that he could easily address by visiting in person. So it fell to Lady Bird to enter this hostile territory. Using her personal charm and astute rhetorical instincts, she crafted a vision and, and of commonality. Her Whistle Stop Tour was a strategic performance of conciliatory strategies that demonstrated how the South could restore its faith in LBJ. Lady Bird embodied the rhetorical image of the Southern woman as a vehicle for her appeals for a South that valued the common good over adherence to differences. As John B. Hatch notes in his analysis of racial reconciliation, quote, much promise lies in a rhetorical performance of the healing, interweaving interpersonal and public discourses and, and as a matter of fact, or rather as an exercise of faith that the personal and the communal do and should intersect. In particular, Lady Bird's distinctive performance of Southern womanhood opened a space for this reconciliation. In her vision of a racially tolerant South, she was once at genteel and steely, challenging her audiences to recast their identities as Southerners to embrace their legacy of hospitality rather than hate. So as we prepare to depart the station, first a bit of background. 
So this is a quotation um, that I take from one of the commentators that I will um, describe for you. Among 20th century first ladies, Claudia Alta Taylor Johnson has received scant attention, really, in regard to her rhetorical style and her political significance. In addition to having the distinction of occupying the role of first lady during the emergent second wave feminism in the turbulent 1960s, uniquely, mod among, uniquely among modern first ladies who preceded her, she also embodied the South in that role. After suddenly and tragically being launched into the complicated public role of first lady, Lady Bird Johnson astutely negotiated the acute demands of her status as first lady and succeeded in forging an image that captured her devotion to family, yet reflected her strength and her insight. From her view, at the center of the political and cultural crosswinds of the 1960s, she proposed that women's roles were in transition. Uh, in an address to Radcliffe, she said that a new woman was emerging in the US, quote, the natural woman, the complete woman. However, uh, this new woman did not, quote, want to be the long striding feminist in low heels engaged in a conscious war with men, unquote, but rather she hoped, quote, to be preeminently, preeminently a woman, a wife, a mother, a thinking citizen, unquote. Lady Bird Johnson distinctively enacted the first lady role by merging her, her southern character with this cautious feminism. And even though she had the extraordinary preparation for the role from her long tenure as a Washington wife and her years as the second lady in the Kennedy White House, Johnson did not have an easy entry into her new status as first lady. In the national press, unflattering comparisons to her predecessor came early, as in this commentary from Time Magazine in 1964. Quote, she is no glamour girl. Her nose is a bit too long, her mouth a bit too wide, her ankles a bit less than trim, and she is not outstanding at close horsemanship. She has a voice something like a brassy low note on a trumpet, and she speaks in a twanging drawl, unquote. Other commentators were more perceptive, uh, seeing in her some of the steel, will, and intelligence that resided beneath the seemingly unsophisticated Southern surface. Marlene Hunter noted in the New York Times in 1963 that Lady Bird was, quote, a human dynamo with a y'all come personality but the mind of a Wall Street banker, quote. So the expectations for first ladies, though, are extreme because the first family is constantly accessible to the public. And as rhetorical scholar Carlin Kors Campbell describes this context, quote, her every word is scrutinized in the belief that she is a reliable sign of the values and the underlying beliefs of her husband. So accordingly, the First Lady becomes a lightning rod for discontent within his administration. For Lady Bird, Lyndon's support of civil rights legislation created tremendous pressure on her and significantly structured the expectations of the Whistle Stop Tour, particularly as she traveled into the deeper reaches of the South. She had to step lightly and carefully across these spaces locating herself both as an insider and as an authority who was in a position to offer gentle admonitions. Now, first ladies also overwhelmingly are constrained by the ruling values and gender ideologies of their times. As much as Lady Bird did not see herself as that, quote, low-heeled, strident advocate, she also did not fit the stereotype of the domestic first lady who was content to be in the shadows behind her husband. Ted Lewis in the New York Daily News noted this difference in 1964. Quote, in 1960, Jackie Kennedy was more often seen than her. So, too, was Mrs. Richard Nixon. This time, Lady Bird Johnson is going to be seen and heard, breaking significantly with the tradition that the First Lady should sit coyly on the platform, clutching a bouquet while her husband makes his partisan appeal, unquote. So Lady's Bird image of the First Lady also was further complicated, yet also enhanced by the mythic dimensions of the Southern womanhood that were attached to her. 
She embraced these limitations uh, of, this, of the classic Southern lady image, particularly taking advantage of the rhetorical resources invested in these feminine aspects, while also slyly expanding its parameters. She didn't underplay her Southerness, but rather forged from it an image of strength and womanhood that honored the South, yet challenged its views of women, race, and social justice. More specifically, of course, Lady Bird embodied a particular brand of Southern womanhood, the Texan variety. Associated with directness and truth-telling, the Texas dimension in her background blended in provocative ways with Lady Bird's domestic image. Forged with aspects of feminine style that in her fellow Texan, Ann Richards, would become iconic, the dimensions of narrative, concrete examples, and specific anecdotes typical of this rhetorical posture powerfully undergirded the subtle political critique that Lady Bird brought to the stage. So the Whistle Stop tour then was the first sustained view that the public had of this new brand of Southern Lady and of Lady Bird in the First Lady role, but of course reworked to forward a Texan woman's tradition of frank speaking, sweetened by the gentility and loyalty of the Southern Belle, and undergirded by incisive political instincts. She previously had proved her mettle by campaigning as part of Lyndon Johnson's 1960, 1960 Whistle Stop Tour. But up to this point, no First Lady had ever undertaken a journey like this unaccompanied by her husband. So as we prepare to board the train, right, all aboard here with the Whistle Stop, um, let me tell you a little bit about the planning for the trip and the design of the Lady Bird special. Uh, so this is actually one of the, the uh, archival documents that was in the collections at the LBJ Library, the original um, architectural design of, of course, the platform um, and the representation that you have out here just outside the doors. So particularly the performative aspects of the tour in these planning documents and in the archival documents reveal how her enactment of Southern hospitality was seen as framing the whole enterprise. The archival documents depict a frank reading of the hostility she was likely to face and the explicit plan to use her feminine style to soften the blunt edges of the South's anger. In preparation for her political role, Lady Bird embraced the traditional expectations, yet she did refuse to yield regarding the core of her conciliatory vision. She approached the idea of the Whistle Stop campaign with great seriousness. As Jan Jarbo Russell observed, quote, she viewed it as a test of her loyalty to her Southern roots. There was an awful lot of mythology in Lady Bird's view of the South, and in turn, of the South's view of her. Now, the original idea for the Whistle Stop tour was expressed in a memo from Lady Bird's press secretary, Liz Carpenter, to, written to Mrs. Johnson, dated September 2nd, 1964. Quote, next to the president, Mrs. Johnson is the ticket's best drawing power in the South and could keep governors and local politicos from feeling neglected as the national figures politic elsewhere, unquote. Interestingly, the initial plan set out a trip of 10 days and 14 states from Washington, D.C. to Austin, Texas, culminating at the LBJ Ranch in the Texas Hill Country. In her memoir, Liz Carpenter describes the reasons for the trip. Quote, in 1964, it was a salvage operation in the wake of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Our star attraction was a Southern bred first lady. We were supposed to blow kisses and spread love through eight states and make them like it, right, unquote. However, Carpenter also recalls how the First Lady instead insisted on visiting potentially hostile locations. And this is Lady Bird, quote, don't give me the easy towns, Liz. Anyone can get into Atlanta. It's the new modern South. Let me take the tough ones. And Liz Carpenter concludes that meant the places neither LVJ or HHH could get in and out of with their hide on. So Lady Bird herself takes the credit for the plan that narrowed the trip to four days in eight states, quote, 
By my insistence and after much discussion, we whittled the trip down to four days. I was anxious to concentrate heavily on North Carolina and give Virginia more stops than we had planned. We all agreed that we should bear down on Georgia. And of course, as this planning continued, within the White House, the documents revealed that strategic concerns were raised among the White House staff in regard to how the Whistle Stop campaign might work in concert with a woman, of all things, as the key figure. So in a memo to Liz Carpenter, for example, Lyndon Johnson's aide, Horace Busby, expresses his reservations and suggests that the best strategy to be used to greatest effect would be, quote, most audiences will want to smile with their first lady. Not humor, not big laughs, but warm, friendly, ingratiating lines are to be desired. Busby also noted that the draft of the first speech that, that had been circulating in the White House that was to be delivered in Alexandria, Virginia, featured the kind of, quote, soberness and serious that was to be avoided in whistle-stopping. However, he also admitted that his comments probably would have little effect, as Johnson herself had authored that draft. Indeed, it was this very quality of substance which gave the rhetorical style of the speeches delivered during the tour their weight and their dimension. Far from the smile lines that Busby envisioned, the address delivered by Lady Bird, all, of the, all 47 of them, provide clear statements of value to her audiences. All right, I'm going to take you further aboard the train here. Ah. There's a familiar picture you may have seen before, and of course that you had fe fe featured on your website. So as we think about what we're going to experience as we take this train ride with Lady Bird through the South, let me tell you a little bit more about some further preparations that were set in, in motion that would take full advantage of the Southern style and the political pageantry. The White House team of advanced men and women set out to work generating the local support, massaging political egos and coordinating pep bands and crowds that would greet Mrs. Johnson at each stop. During its four-day journey, the Whistle Stop Tour provided Southern audiences with a significant concoction of Southern recipes, localized rhetorical appeals, and old-style political performance. Lady Bird herself approached the, the whistle stop with a set of deep personal con convictions and connections and with a complete understanding of the political stakes. In particular, her recognition of her, the rhetorical effect of her southerness was acute. Now this view was revealed in remarks that she made to an advance team at a White House meeting before the train departed where she stated, quote, I know the Civil Rights Act was right, and I don't mind saying so. But I'm tired of people making the South the whipping boy of the Democratic Party. There are plenty of people who make snide jokes about corn pone and redneck. I'm no hard sell person. But what I want to say to those people is that I love the South. I'm proud of the South. I know there have been great achievements there. And I want them to know that as far as this president and his wife are concerned, the South belongs to the United States. For me, it's going to be a journey of the heart. So Lady Bird's journey of the heart then was transmuted for the press into an old fashioned political affair, yet one with historical significance because she was traveling without Lyndon. Still, the first lady could be depicted as a pioneer only in so much as she also conformed to the domestic and womanly expectations that shaped the role, especially in 1964. A White House press release from August, 9, August 22nd, 1964 states, for example, quote, Lady Bird Johnson's penchant for being herself and contributing on her own does not detract from, but rather adds to the primary role of wife and mother. She very efficiently manages two homes, two teenagers, acts as eyes, ears, reporter, and supporter for the president on her own hectic traveling and speaking schedule, and also manages what she has called, quote, the complete women. So these kinds of statements coming out of the White House indicate the kind of dual tensions that Lady Bird had to negotiate as she sought to embody the faithful political wife and mother, yet also stretch that role 
to include the woman who is strong, thoughtful, and uncompromising. Of course, the reactions to the journey in the local press then reveal how the planned image of the First Lady was re received and was reinforced. Much initial commentary in the press regarding Lady Bird Johnson's journey centered on what traditionally are the feminine soft news angles, such as appearance and wardrobe and family. Uh, yet these aspects also, though, were crucial in the successful performance of the whistle stop. The strategic release of this soft information by the White House staff framed the press reception and emphasized the practicality and femininity of Mrs. Johnson. These themes and of femininity and family also were foregrounded in descriptions of our hostesses for the train. As revealed in a White House memo that defined the staff assignments for the Lady Bird special, quote, 15 attractive ladies to act as welcomers and assist wherever needed. Serve coffee, provide color at various stops, and visit with guests are all functions of this group. Liz Carpenter further described their rhetorical function in relation to the Southern womanhood, womanhood themes. Quote, our hostesses for the train were a group of Southern-born beauties in their 20s and 30s. Bright blue shirtwaist dresses, white gloves, and white roll brim hats were the hostess's uniform. Against the backdrop of Bess Abel's red and white striped tin canopy over the back platform of the train, the effect was colorful cheesecake. <laughs> the parameters of the physical design, then, both regarding Lady Bird's appearance and her attendant beauties, clearly played upon the traditional outlines of Southern femininity, cloaking the entire enterprise in the fabric of soft feminine style and fam familial concerns. All right, now that we are about to go aboard the train and we're there with Lady Bird, what do we see? Right. Well, the Lady Bird special actually was the Queen Mary, originally built in 1930 by the Wabash Railroad and then was refurbished for this trip. Uh, according to the New York Times, the train featured powder blue insides, um, and Lady Bird's living quarters were painted green, dubbed by the White House staff as the Rolling Green, a reference to the green room in the White House. On board, we are joined by 100 reporters, a number that later swelled to 140 as the train traveled through its 47 stops. Liz Carpenter described the inherent goodness of fit between the strange strategy and the audience. Quote, small southern towns are made to order for whistle stops. The depot is still downtown, right in the middle of the main street. J.C. Penney's on one side and International Harvester is on the other with its shiny red tractors. To engage these small town features to the best advantage, the train stops in each locale were carefully orchestrated to include local politicians, or at least their wives and families, local high school bands and cheer squads, and local references in each of the First Lady's speeches. Now, as we travel on the train through these communities, be sure to look out your windows. Right? Um, Nan Robertson of the New York Times noted, quote, the grinning faces stretched down the railroad tracks as far as anyone could see. She reported that on the second day of the tour, quote, several thousand persons or more turned out at every one of the stops, no matter how small the community, and that Negroes in large numbers appeared at all the stops. As one member of LBJ's campaign entourage noted, from, he was there, uh, part of the entourage in 1960 noted, God Almighty, they weren't out like this for Lyndon the last time. As our Lady Bird special pulls into the station, the pageantry is evident. Our hostesses hand out balloons, peppermint taffy, and toys to children. Uh, Nan Robertson from the New York Times wrote, quote, that the shrill, the shrill keening of the plastic train whistles given to the children filled the air. For the local officials and special guests, old-time political tokens were handed out. And these are illustrations of the designs of what those tokens looked like that I found um, as part of the collection in um, the LBJ Library. So 
all of these tokens included 4,000 train charms and tie bars in 10 karat gold, 1,000 charms in sterling silver, and 1,000 each of charms and tie bars in 14 karat gold. I hmm, wonder who got those. <laughs> also, paper railroad engineer hats, pre-printed banners, and red, white, and blue bunting abounded. In all, this local flavor and celebratory tone for Lady Bird's appearances established an appearance of goodwill and sincere interest in the places and the people that the Whistle Stop Tour encountered. In turn, Lady Bird gained an entry into the good graces of her audience, ingratiating herself by enacting the Southern woman's good manners and charm. All right, you hungry? All right. Back aboard the train, be sure to note how the emphasis on Southern food and Southern hospitality was part of the Whistle Stop strategy. Lady Bird associated herself with phenomena viewed positively, food especially, by her Southern audience. Southern hospitality and cuisine were featured in advanced press releases about the trip, as well as became a significant and influential part of the experience right, for, the people, for the reporters and the dignitaries who rode the train. The connection forged to the specific Southern locales added to the pageantry and created an, a sense of identification and connection for Lady Bird's audiences. For example, a White House press release from October 1st, 1964 announced the snacks to be served aboard. Quote, Mrs. London B. Johnson's Whistle Stop Train, the Lady Bird Special, will also feature another special. Special LBJ Ranch and Southern dishes to be served on the train at snack time. All four days between the hours of 4 p.m. and the stopping time for the night. A different ranch and southern dish will be served each day to those riding the train in addition to the regular menu. This press release also included recipes for chili con queso, pickled okra, guacamole, chili dip for 100, as well as Mrs. Herman Talmadge's recipe for ham. Lady Bird also handed out these recipes along the route. So the emphasis on recipes and food functioned to connect right, Lady Bird to the domestic concerns on the one hand, while also serving as a means of connecting with the specific locales and the, the specific people that she encountered. Food provided a personal means of communicating her southern credentials and identifying herself with her audiences and flattering the different communities through which she traveled. Thus, as we rhetoricians say, she created a sense of consubstantiality, a common substance created based on common values and common experiences. The menus from the Lady Bird Special's dining car, and there's, I think the luncheon menu is out on your display. This is the breakfast menu. I, um, Featured Southern cuisine mixed with clever puns. Included in the dinner menu were, quote, whistling Dixie fried shrimp, fried half spring chicken a la landslide, baked mainstream grouper political sauce. The luncheon feature um, featured soap, soups and promises and the LBJ special, which was Perdinalis River chili. Special menu items also were added for each state such as Smithfield baked ham and peanuts for Virginia, buttermilk biscuits and smothered steak in North Carolina, and corn fritters and chicken and dumplings for Alabama. Fellow travelers on the train, especially the press, could not escape right, the evocation of Southern culture and the particular brand of humor, both of which reinforced the image of Lady Bird as part of the landscape through which she journeyed. And the image of Southern gentility made it possible for her to surround herself fascinatingly with the local political figures, particularly the reluctant Democratic male leaders who in turn, when they appeared, reinforced her strategic, strategic use of, of feminine style. Jan Jarbo Russell describes the rhetorical power of her embodiment of this feminine. Quote, Lady Bird realized that Southern Democrats held her on a pedestal. And during her whistle stop tour in the fall of 1964, she used that pedestal as a moving political platform, unquote. Indeed, the fact that Southern chivalry was not dead and was evidenced in the whistle stop 
was, happened when more and more male political leaders joined the train and praised Lady Bird and Lyndon. And then this was not lost on local reporters and commentators. For example, Charles McDowell from the Richard, Richmond Times-Dispatch adroitly noted, quote, for local Democratic leaders under pressure from Goldwater Reuters, this is a relatively easy train to climb aboard. After all, who could criticize a Southern gentleman for giving gallant escort to a lady, unquote. So the presence of the formerly reluctant local Democrats on the train platform next to Lady Bird provided a visual reinforcement for the argument that the South supported the president and his ideals. And in her speeches, she would build upon this symbolism to craft her transformational definitions of the South's future that were grounded in these shared Southern values. So the Southern lady and its rhetorical power were also evident in Lady Bird's encounter with hecklers, particularly in Columbia, South Carolina, of an incident that was widely reported in Southern newspapers as well as featured in the national news reports. Members of this crowd shouted out Goldwater slogans and beat loud drums while she spoke. As Liz Carpenter describes the incident, quote, it was surprisingly ugly and it left us all aghast. Shocked, the crowds looked to see how the First Lady would handle this startling discourtesy. She did not disappoint them. One hand raised gently, she said, my friends, in this country we are entitled to many viewpoints. You are entitled to yours, but right now I am entitled to mine. Now, interestingly, I think even Alabama's governor ultimately played tribute to the Southern Lady aboard the, Lind the Lady Bird Special. Upon reaching Flomaton, Alabama, the first stop in the state, Carpenter recounts, quote, waiting for us at Flomaton, much to our surprise, was a large bouquet of red roses sent by Governor George Wallace. The prominent press reports of the calm demeanor of Lady Bird in the face of incivility and taming even her most infamous foe functioned to further cement the Southern lady image. She was able to continue to draw upon its rhetorical reservoir as well as deepen the impressions of her candor and strength as the tour progressed. Now, finally, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about the content of those 47 speeches in 47 days. So this foundation that I've been establishing for you of the Southern womanhood and the feminine style allowed Lady Bird Johnson the means to assert a new definition of Southern values into the context of the 1964 election. She located the necessity for civil rights among other nostalgic and regional elements that constituted the traditional image of the South. Her addresses to the audiences along the Whistle Stop Tour skillfully blended the feminine style elements expressively described by Lee Winfrey of the Charlotte Observer as, quote, chatty and as, and as Southern as Magnolia with her transformative appeals in her speeches. Between the lines of the polite speech, her evocation of Southern womanhood enabled her to redefine the South stretching its boundaries to include civil rights and the politics of LBJ, and to envision tolerance as central to the definition and redemption of the Southern character. Now, the rhetoric of re reconciliation more generally draws upon legacies of a shared past. And typically this kind of rhetoric struggles, you know, sort of highlights the struggles and then enables negotiations over what that past means. And an invitation then to share common ground can be particularly powerful when the call supplies a means to reconcile with the darker and unsettling aspects of the past. Lady Bird's rhetoric of reconciliation and her enactment of Southern womanhood helped to mediate between the identity of the South grounded in the past of segregation and move it toward the South in identified with hospitality and gentility. So her vision of the South embraced its kindness and its legacies, yet also called for resistance against the stifling power of tradition for its own sake. So Johnson's status as a Southern lady allowed her the platform from which to challenge racial hierarchy 
um, and that was what was so entrenched in the Southern identity. At each stop on the tour, her speeches bolstered this pride and graciously complimented local people and places. And these rhetorical moves strategically provided the grounds for her to then frankly identify opponents of civil rights as having violated these common Southern values. And this allowed her then to promote her vision of the New South as the redemptive path. So the conciliatory arguments linking Southern pride and progressive ideals are expressed in most of the 47 speeches um, that she delivered. In particular, Lady Bird's words in the first speech in Alexandria, Virginia at the start of the Whistle Stop Tour illustrate the rhetorical tactic. And, the, or, and, and, and they're the most direct instance of her discussion of civil rights. Following a reference to the lack of respect given the South in this first speech, she states, quote, I know that many of you do not agree with the Civil Rights Bill or the President's support of it, but I do know the South, and I know it respects candor and courage, and I believe that he has shown both. It would be a bottomless tragedy for our country to be racially divided. And here I want to say empathetically that this is not a challenge only in the South. It is a challenge in the big cities in the North as well as in the states of the South. Interestingly there, she previews exactly what Lyndon says a year later in the voting rights speech. That it's not a Southern problem, it's not a Northern problem, it's an American problem. She follows this comment with a Southern lady's assessment of the situation, where after paying tribute to the local Southern leaders and quote, Mr. and Mr. John citizens who live in our community, she states, quote, this convinces me of something I've always believed, that there is in this Southland more love than hate. The rhetorical form then and the format that she would lose, use in all of the addresses of the tour was grounded in this personalization, followed by the local flattery, the references to the political figures, and then would culminate in this appeal for the change and her vision of the New South. In the structure of the argument, her love of and personal connection to the South and her respect for the locale in which she spoke and traveled always came first with each community receiving its own tribute. So she's careful in all of these speeches to remind them that she is the South and the South is a part of her. For example, um, she says, Quote, I feel that I'm returning to familiar territory and heading into a place I call home. And she's careful to express this in every speech. Consequently, she can make the argument that the political views that she and her, that she and her husband hold are not foreign to the South, but are constituted in it. And as she traveled on from her starting point in Alexandria, sometimes the message about civil rights became more oblique uh, replaced by references to problems ahead, whoops, <laughs> or uh, needs or expanding horizons. And in the speeches then that she delivered to crowds in the larger cities along the route, the message of transformation was stronger and more developed. However, in almost all of them, she set out a vision of a South unburdened by myths and lost causes, as in her comments in Norfolk, Virginia, quote, it requires a faith that the future can really be bright, not a devotion to a past that never was. She articulated a nuanced argument that the New South has no room for old ideas and glorifying a mythic history. Rather, she and Lyndon represented the reconciliation that was characteristic of the future. So through the 47 addresses in 47 cities, Lady Bird Johnson summoned all of the rhetorical resources of her own experience in order to hold the mirror up to the South. The place that she reflected back to the audience was grounded in an abiding faith that the people of the South would recognize their pride in their noble past, but in turn embody the new roles that she argued were consistent with that image and identity. She concluded her address in Thomasville, Georgia, uh, saying that she believed that the audience had the capacity to, to change this climate, quote, from fear and distrust to courage and faith. All right, so let me put, draw a few conclusions for you here. 
as um, I wrap this all up for you and before we depart the train. Right. So the whistle stop tour did yield substantial, if mixed, benefits um, politically for Lyndon in the outcome of the 1964 election. The White House's belief that it would be difficult to attack a Southern woman in the South where women are respected if revered proved correct. However, as Lewis Gold notes, the political fortunes of the Democrats in the South already had begun to turn. The trip did not reverse Goldwater's inroads or Republican sentiment in the South. And four states in which she had campaigned went Republican in the fall election. Her appearances did, however, underscore Democratic interest in the South and may have minimized defections from the party. More importantly, I think, Ladies Bird's rhetoric stretched the South's boundaries to include not only a more directly political, independent, and courageous first lady than had ever been witnessed, but also a different version of those Southern landscapes. Her discursive connection between the South of the future and the political progressive programs provided a justification for the essential moral and Southern right course that LBJ's politics embodied. And as she described this responsibility to her audience at the final stop in the tour in New Orleans, Louisiana, she said, quote, I am aware that there are those who would exploit its past troubles to their own advantage, but I do not believe that the majority of the South wants any of that old bitterness. And the more that I have seen this past few days, the more that I know that's true. Unquote. So the whistle stop also, I think one more important point, represents a significant moment of transition in the role of the First Lady. Where previously the President's wife largely has served as the domestic or the maternal icon, Johnson explicitly, you know, with her political advocacy, redefined the First Lady as a political partner. Lady Bird brought a new sophistication and a savvy to her position, demonstrating in the Whistle Stop Tour that she had both a voice and a presence that were integral to politics, not just the pageantry in the White House. As Lewis Gould argued, quote, for Mrs. Johnson herself, the Lady Bird special was a sign of her clear emergence as a public figure on her own terms. She had set a precedent for First Ladies in her personal campaigning, and she brought it off in style, unquote. So far from the Southern bumpkin that the national press initially had perceived, the power of Lady Bird's rhetoric resided in her acknowledgement of the limits of her role, but also her acknowledgement and recognition of the potential resources that those same boundaries contained. As David Miller of CBS News noted about Lady Bird upon her death in 2007, quote, she subtly challenged the idea of what we want from political spouses, maintaining a public identity true to her private self. It might just have been the shrewdest use of the impossible office of the First Lady this country has ever had.